The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Hey, Paul. Garth Fundus is joining us. He's been called one of the most respected record producers. He's produced many albums, including for the late Don Williams, the last album of Keith Whitley, just about every Trisha Yearwood album, New Grass Revival, yeah, (laughs) Sugarland's first record. He's worked as a session vocalist, recording engineer. He's also a record label executive. Garth Fundus, thanks so much for being here. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Paul. Thanks for thanks for thinking of me. I wanted to pretty much get your thoughts on why you in particular became a record producer. What was it about that particular title or that partic- <laughs> per- not title, but pursuit, I should say? Well, it wasn't a pursuit. It, it caught me more than I caught it. I, uh, like many young musicians, wannabes, trying to figure out what they want to do with their life, I moved to Nashville in 1971, having played in a lot of bands, horn bands, seven, eight piece horn bands. And, and up from the time I was probably sophomore in high school through college and, and met some people in Memphis, Alan Reynolds and Dickie Lee and Bob McGill, among those who were pretty closely associated with Jack Clement at that, at that time. But I had not met Jack at that point, but uh, I had met Dickie and Alan and Bob when we this band I was in uh, traveled to Memphis to do some recording and uh, it was it was exciting my first time in the recording studio to of of any consequence and they all moved to Nashville within a year or two and within a year or two I left the band that I was in and uh, I moved to Nashville really not knowing what was going to happen I wasn't a huge fan of country music but I knew Alan and Dickie and Bob had moved here and Alan encouraged me to be here. And he really kind of became my mentor. And I, he helped me find a job as a gopher in the studio, go for this, go for that kind of thing, you know, and was a second engineer for about a year, year and a half before uh, a couple of the engineers there started teaching me the ropes on how to be a recording engineer. And, you know, I got to work on the first Don Williams album uh, for JMI Records, for Jack Jack Clements label. And Alan was producing it. And Don wrote for Jack's publishing company, as did Dickie and Bob and Alan and, and the crew. So I got to be at the beginning of that and got to sing a little harmony here and there and became part of the crew overdub and doing a lot of the overdubs as a recording engineer, eventually moving into the first chair as a recording engineer, as experience grew on me. Don took a liking to me and eventually he and Alan had parted ways. I became his go-to engineer for a lot of those early records of his. He was producing himself after parting ways with Alan and Jack. And so you're my best friend till the rivers all run dry. <laughs> all of those records, I engineered those records and Don and I mixed them together. And so we kind of became a team and he invited me one day. He said, you know, I think I'd like to make this a co-production thing. And I just looked at him, thought, well, that's awesome. So that was my first, that was my first credit as a producer. And I, it wasn't something I sought out. I, I, I wanted to be an artist at one point, you know, many times in my life. I was le- always a lead singer in any band I was in. But when I got to Nashville, I realized even the guy delivering UPS packages to the front door was a pretty good singer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it, you know, the competition was fierce. And I, I, I wasn't, you know, crazy about country music at that point. I was just excited to be somewhere where I could work and be in the studio and, and enjoy that. And I just kind of grew into the job. I was a, I was a uh, music major in college and played many instruments a little bit, master of none. 
thought I was going to be a high school band director. I realized that wasn't a very lucrative profession and decided to kind of pursue something else. And I didn't know what that was, but I went searching and came to Nashville and basically became a recording engineer and then uh, was invited to be a co-producer with Don. And for my success with Don, RCA called me to take a visit with a young bluegrass singer that wanted to sing country music. And Mary Martin, I had become friends with her, and she wanted me to visit with this young guy they had named Keith Whitley. And uh, he and I hit it off right away. And that was my second production <laughs> credit. Trisha Yearwood, years later, I found out was uh, when we first met, was a huge Keith Whitley fan. And because of the Keith Whitley record, I got to produce Trisha Yearwood. So it's uh, it wasn't anything I pursued. It was something I just kind of grew into. But really, you know, very fortunate to get to work with those three amazing vocalists. Now, you mentioned a couple of times that Country music wasn't necessarily your thing. So what kind of music were you primarily interested in? Well, I, I played in uh, blues bands, basically Blue-Eyed Soul. <laughs> and, you know, we emulated a lot of the Stax records stuff, also Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears, those early records, John Mayle and Blues Breakers. And that's the kind of stuff I was really into. Although I will say when I was about 13, I think my brother came home on a visit from the uh, army and he brought me a guitar that he paid 10 bucks for in a pawn shop in Texas. And I learned to play the guitar with some, I grew up in a very small town in Kansas and I learned to play guitar from a few people that I knew who kind of had these monthly jam sessions, I'd call them uh, hootenannies, I think is what they used to call them. But these people played country music. And that's how I learned to play guitar, was playing that music. And I didn't think I really cared for it all that much, except that the one radio that we had in our house, it was always tuned to this radio station in Lawrence, Kansas. And I heard a lot of country music on that old radio. And uh, flowers on the wall, and the Statler brothers, and and on and on. It kind of grew on me, uh, country music, and working with Don. Don came from more of a folk background, so it wasn't like, you know, crying in your beer country music. But I, I, I acquired a taste <laughs> for it, and there was so much great music going on around me, you couldn't help but appreciate it. And one of the things, one of the other things that really made me think Nat Nashville would be okay, I discovered the Mickey Newberry albums that had been done in the, the late '60s, and I thought, man, if they're making music like that in Nashville, I, I, that might be worth a visit and checking it out. So Newberry was really a big influence on my acceptance of of liking country music. And once I got here, I became immersed in. You couldn't escape it. And uh, it's an, like I said, it, it's an acquired taste for me. And uh, but I loved it. And getting to be front and center in the beginning of Don Williams' career was really an education. And and the same with getting to work with Keith Whitley. I knew a lot about music. I knew a lot about the recording gear. I could get it on tape, you know. And I knew how to guide singers because I'd been a singer myself. I knew how to talk to musicians because I had studied music and understood it. And so I kind of had the language and didn't realize I could do something with it until I got to Nashville. Hmm. So it was an interesting journey to get where I, where I, where I got to. I'm a big fan of Don Williams work. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and I'm hoping you can tell us about those early recordings. What, is maybe a vivid memory from being in the studio with the, the late Don Williams. Well, when I first got to Nashville, like I said, in 71, they, uh, Jack had started this record labeled JMI Records, Jack Music International. 
He also had a publishing company called Jack Music. And he had the studio, Jack Clement Recording Studios. It was the first 16-track recording studio in Nashville. And I got to, be, again, be front and center to witness uh, an experiment. The Jack and Alan and Don, Bob McDill, Dickie Lee, all of those cats were honing their craft and expressing themselves in the song. And McDill was just the beginning of his of his uh, arc of success. And they started doing these, I think they called them Thursday things, where Kenny Malone, the musicians, Kenny Malone, Joe Allen, Jimmy Covard, Lloyd Green, those folks all would show up every Thursday for a couple, you know, for the whole day. And they'd, cut demos or just try to experiment with different kinds of things. And that's how they kind of created this thing for Don. I mean, Don always kind of had a pretty good handle of what he wanted and what he didn't want, but he was just, this voice of his was just the resonance (laughs) of it. And it was easy for him. I mean, like I said, he came from a folk background. He wasn't, trying to sing hard or or impress you with his vocal prowess, he sang stories. And that's the kind of music everybody was writing. You know? And it was, he didn't sing aloud, he just told the story and sang the story. And tried, as he would put it, tried not to get in the way of the song. Let the song, trust the song and just tell the story. But that tone of his was something to marvel, you know? And a lot of times we kept the vocals that he sang live as the musicians were putting it down. It wasn't about going back and doing two or three days of vocals and making it just perfect. Nobody tuned anything back in those days. You had you either had talent or you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was... Uh, he was a wonderful example for me of what could be in a, in a, in a way that no one else was doing at that time. I think maybe Bobby Bear, I would describe as the closest thing to Don Williams at that point. Very laid back, very easygoing. It was uh, an education for me, for sure. So how do you think a producer brings out the best in an artist that he or she is working with? Well, you need to kind of have a handle on, you definitely need to have a handle on what they want and, you know, to help them. I think I've always tried to help an artist not be someone else, but be the best person they or as far as singing and performing, kind of getting it, not letting it go off the rails, try to keep them on track. And it's a, it's a gentle nudge here and there. It's nothing very strident or, or directorial on my part as much as suggestions. You know, let's try this. What if you took that note a little easier there or that line? You know, it's pretty subtle stuff I think I, I bring to the table. But in the end, lots of little things mean a lot. Interesting. What do you mean by that? Lots of little things mean a lot. Well, you know, a little, a little nudge here, a little nudge there. It may not make much difference to the average listener. If you just take each one of those things on their own, but when you put them all together, they sound like a, they hopefully they sound like that artist's best rendition. <laughs> I see. If that makes, if that makes sense. With that said, have there ever been occasions where you've been working with an artist and the vision that you have is not exactly the same as what the artist has in mind? And what do you do? That's an interesting question. I mean, there have been a few times where I maybe felt like I misunderstood someone or they misunderstood me. And, you know, we just a few minutes of just kind of talking it out would usually rectify it. I don't think there's ever 
been a situation where I was completely lost as to what the artist wanted to do. I try to get all that pretty much under under uh, an understanding of that before I, you know, before we get going. I try to spend as much time with them, hear the songs, hear them sing the songs before we get to the session. Uh, you know, just sitting in a room with a guitar or a piano and just talking about it and just appreciating the song together with that artist and trying different keys, trying different tempos. Um, just spending that time together creates a sense of understanding of, of what the goal is for that person. And, you know, people that like, like, you know, there's some artists that really don't have a handle on what it is. I, I'll do anything. I don't, I don't know. Just, I just want to be successful. That's, that's not the kind of people that I generally uh, work with. I've usually worked with people who know who they are, you know, Don Williams, Trish Yearwood, Keith Woodley, uh, Jennifer Nettles, Sugar Land, uh, you know, they have, they're, those are talented people. They know kind of what, what it is they want to do. They've got some experience that never involved me. And, uh, I need to, it's my job to get an understanding of what, what it is they want and where they want to go. So when an artist says that they want to work with you and you agree, what's the first thing you do when it's time to make an album? How does it begin for you? The songs. It really begins on sharing the songs and the music. It, it, in Don's case, it was a matter of him wanting to share new songs that he'd written. He always had a lot of self-doubt about his own songs. He would almost always defer to a McDill or Dickey or an Allen uh, or other writers, Roger Cook. There were many people who submitted songs for Don later on. It's just finding those things that felt like, in Don's case, that felt like him. You know, that he could sing and feel the lyric was true to what he was as an artist. The story was interesting. Don always said, when people asked him, what do you want your music to do for people? What do you, he said, if it makes them feel something, that's what I, that's what I want. I just want them to feel something, whether no matter what it is, everybody hears music a little differently and it affects them a little differently in certain songs or certain records. You know, it's a subjective thing uh, for people. That was Don's point of view. I usually had to kind of help him understand which of his songs that he had written himself. Don, I know you like these other songs and you don't think these are right for you, but I'm telling you, these three or four songs right here, we've got to do these. These are great. So I was kind of a confirmation for him uh, on his own material to give him the confidence to, to go ahead and do it. I mean, he'd always want to try it, but he often had a few doubts about it, whether his song would hold up as well as someone else's. And I'm, I'm, I think I reinforced uh, that notion for him on occasion. And then just finding other songs, it's finding things that we agree. Well, that's a great song. I'd love to do that. You know, I believe in you was one of those songs, early songs that I found for Don from somebody else that he'd never done any of their material, Roger Cook. And Don ultimately ended up doing three or four songs of, of Rogers over, over the years. Patricia, she wasn't a writer. So I kind of had to go out and find songs that made sense for her. Uh, the first song I ever pitched to her that I felt this could be an interesting record. I think she'd have fun with it was she's in love with the boy first song i ever pitched to her <laughs> and she was reading the lyric and listening to it she looked at me since i love this and I, I thought well this it's got to be harder than this come on <laughs> <laughs> the first song really that's great yeah that was that was awesome and the same for keith whitley he didn't he was he could write but he didn't really worry about his own material he he wanted hit songs he wanted things that he could he could latch on to and it could give him a career. He wanted great country music. That's 
he had grown up playing bluegrass and he wanted to make country records now. And uh, one of the early songs that I brought to him were Don't Close Your Eyes When You Say Nothing At All and I'm No Stranger to the Rain. And that kind of that kind of sealed the deal for me. <laughs> you know, when he heard those songs, I was bringing him those types of that type of material. And I think that's one of the things that I was good at was matching, going out and finding songs from, you know, Nashville had so many great and still does have so many great songwriters. That it was like, you know, it's like walking out into the orchard <laughs> and finding the fruit, the best fruit possible. If I had to climb the tree to get it, I'd, I'd go there, you know, but they didn't always fall in our lap, but they're out there. And there was a lot of things to listen to and just, you know, being patient and, you know, making your way through the thousands of songs that people would pitch, pitch to us. I, I actually, when I first had an intern or an assistant, I asked to kind of, I asked them to kind of keep track of how many songs I was going through for an album. And it was about 3,000 songs. Wow. Just to find 10, just to find 10. The, I mean, this is, these are all great writers, but not every song's made for everybody. So, you know, it was, it was, it was tedious. It's a tedious process. Hmm. You know, since since you agreed to do this interview, I've been noticing a lot of Keith Whitley songs. I would be listening to the radio, and I would hear, I could hear one syllable of him singing, and I would know that's Keith Whitley. Yeah, unmistakable. Absolutely. He was just, again, much like Don, he had a resonance and a, and a sense of self that was awesome. <laughs> the best word I could use. He, I'm, I read, a, I was reading an interview recently that he did with Lon Helton, not Lon Helton. Anyway, I was reading an interview that he did recently that he talked about, he described himself, I'm an emotional singer. When I'm, when I'm singing, I kind of shut everything out. And, and he crawls inside the song. <laughs> and I saw that many times when he played live because he'd come off stage and asked me, how did it sound? I said, fantastic. He said, I couldn't hear a thing, you know, and he would be so in the moment and in the song that it didn't matter what was going on around him or how hard it was. He delivered a performance and he was with the song and not just, trying to impress somebody with his singing or, you know, looking at the audience and dancing around. That's not what he did. He sang the song every time. Could you maybe give us a recollection of working in the studio with Keith Whitley? <laughs> well, it's been a long time, but uh, it was uh, just, it was just pure pleasure. We, it was so easy. The first album, I think we cut, we cut four songs the first day and we cut four songs the second day. And I called Joe Galanti on the third day and I said, come on down and hear this. And he said, really? I, I said, you just, he said, you just started day for yesterday. I said, I know all the vocals are live we didn't do very many overdubs. It's pretty much done. I'm adding some harmony parts today and I think we'll be done with these eight sides. Hmm. And he couldn't, he couldn't believe it. So he came down and, you know, Joe's a New York guy and he, I think like me, uh, country music, country music was an acquired taste for him. <laughs> I remember Joe sitting in between the speakers. The first time I played him, those cuts don't close your eyes and say nothing at all. And things like <laughs> even I like this. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny, but he was a big fan of Keith as a person. And he understood what Keith could do to an audience. You know, I think the Testament of those songs and those records, but mostly Keith's performance for them to endure the way they have and to influence a whole you know, 
decades later, those records are still influencing young young artists who who want to who want that. <laughs> I want to. I love that. I want to be like that. <laughs> And it, it's, it's very satisfying to kind of know that those records we made and in a very short amount of time have stood the test of, not only stood the test of time, but have made such an impression on people. And, and the joy of it is that Keith, Keith will be in the Hall of Fame at some point. I know it. Yeah. That, him not being in the hall, that can't happen. <laughs> There's too many people to credit Keith in, in his short, of his short career of being a major influence uh, on them. Just the way for Keith, it was Lefty Frizzell and George Jones and Merle Haggard uh, in the country world, uh, and tons of bluegrass he grew up in, in, in the Eastern Kentucky world. Uh, but, Country music was for him was Lutzi Frizzell and George Jones and, and Buck Owens and just numerous great, great singers. I, I, I want to see him go into the Hall of Fame soon. I really do. I think he deserves it. And it's, uh, now that Ricky's in, I think it's time for Keith to go in. It might be really hard, but could you pick a recording? One of the songs that was recorded uh, with Keith Whitley that is maybe a favorite of yours. Well, (laughs) I couldn't pick one. I really couldn't uh, because there's so much joy associated uh, with all of those songs. Um, And to... To get a session started and you're getting the sound on the drums and the guitars and the piano and steel and whatnot. And then you open up that mic and he starts singing. Good Lord. It was just, it was just like, like butter. I mean, it was just it, the way it came through and that resonance that he had and the style that he had, what he could do with his voice drop an octave here or there at a you know, second's notice or or put a little trill in something the way he could was it was awesome just to hear him do what he did um i think there might there might be one that i'd have to point out uh it was not a single it was, but it was a song called i never go around mirrors so Whitey Schaefer and Lefty Frizzell song that Keith just loved and wanted to put that on the album. And I, I thought it was amazing. But in our meetings one day when we were getting ready to do this sessions, I said, you know, Keith, there's only one verse in the song. It just kind of repeats the chorus. And he looked at me and said, yeah, <laughs> isn't it great? And I said, wow, wouldn't it be great if there was another verse of this? And he kind of Good smile and looked at me puzzled. She said, well, what do you mean? I said, um, he said, well, Lefty's dead. You know, there's not going to be another verse. I said, well, Whitey's not dead. And he looked at me. <laughs> and I said, what if you ask Whitey to write another verse for this song? How do you think he'd feel? And he just kind of paused for a moment and he said, wow, uh, I guess, I guess I could. And he knew Whitey really well. I mean, Whitey, and Whitey liked him as a young kid who just idolized all those, the lefty and the stuff that Whitey had written. He, he really enjoyed Keith. And he told me the story. He, he called me, he said, I just talked to Whitey on the phone and he said, I asked him if he'd write another verse. He said, it got real quiet. And he said, it was real quiet for about 30 seconds he finally said if it was anybody but you I'd say no but uh, I'll call you back <laughs> and so a couple days later a couple days later Keith's doing something and and the phone rings and he picks it up and it was Whitey's wife and said honey can you come over here Whitey wants to play wants to uh, wants to see you and he said well 
sure, what's up? And she said, well, he's got that verse done, that second verse for that song. And he said, do you mean he, he went ahead and wrote another verse? She said, honey, he's been working on it for two days. He hasn't <laughs> slept. And he's in the shower. He wants you to come over. <laughs> so Keith, Keith went over and Whitey gave him the second verse. And of course he cried. And the story doesn't end. <laughs> and here, the, the day we're getting ready to record the song, scheduled to do it, Keith was driving in. He lived out, he and Lori lived out in Goodlettsville. And Keith, Keith coming in uh, like Dickerson Road or something like that, that it went past the cemetery where Lefty was buried. And it was raining, of course. And Keith drives by, the son pulls in, goes to Lefty's grave, gets his umbrella out and stands over Lefty's grave and sings him the second verse. And then he came on into town. He told me the story much later. But then he came on into town and he did the session and recorded that song. Today. And the new verse, that new verse that never appeared there before Keith's recording, if you go listen, it, it's, it's, it belongs in that song. It's nothing. It's like it was always there. And it's just, it's an amazing, it's an amazing verse. And I'll always be thankful that Whitey uh, took it upon himself to dig in and do it. And that we had the, the nerve to ask Whitey to write another verse for it. You know, Hall of Fame songwriter, what do we know? <laughs> but uh, he did. And and we did. And the day we cut it, it was like, I don't know, there was something. I've spent a lot of years in the studio. But I'll never forget that day. It was a rainy day. And it was like we had angels in the studio with us. And I don't know any other way to describe it. I don't consider myself a very religious person, but there was something going on in the studio that day that was beyond beyond Keith and I. Hmm. Well. There. How about that story? <laughs> <laughs> At the top of the interview, I was listing all the artists that you've worked with, and I mentioned Trisha Yearwood, and I said, just about all of her albums. And you produced just about all of Trisha Yearwood's albums. She's called you the other Garth. <laughs> and I'm yep. hoping you can tell us, aside from her, singing voice. What is Trisha Yearwood's biggest talent? Well, isn't, isn't that enough? <laughs> <laughs> I describe people, her personality and just her way. Or I describe the peop, her to people as she's, I always think of her as an A student. <laughs> she is a smart cookie. She's She's talented in so many ways and one of the most pleasant people you'll ever talk to. She's just such a great person, human being. And, but that voice. And I first heard her sing in a little club called Douglas Corner. She was singing harmonies with Pat Alger, who was a songwriter. And she, she used to do a lot of demos with Pat on his, when he demo songs, new songs that he'd written. Uh, he had this little group called Pat Alger and the Algerians, and she was one of the Algerians, and she would come in and sing harmony on those little gigs that he did. And that's when I first heard her sing, and she, this was like in 90, you know, 1990, I think, and she had been in town several years. She finished her last two years of uh, college at Belmont and took a job as a receptionist at a record label. Mary Tyler Moore owns this record company called MTM Records. And uh, she was the uh, she was the receptionist. She got to know a lot of people. She didn't tell anybody she sang. She just sat there and did her business and greeted people and kept her ears open and her eyes open and watched and learned. And one day she decided that to let people know that she wanted to be a singer. She had a cassette with an up-tempo song and a ballad. And she was handing it out to songwriters, say, hey, if you need a demo singer, give me a shot. People gave her a shot, and she became the go-to 
demo singer. She could sing it. You know, she'd, she'd practice the song on the way to the studio, look at the lyric and listen to the cassette in the car. When she got to the studio, she'd be done in one or two passes. And uh, people would be amazed at what she was able to do. And before they could say, that sounds great, she said, I could put a harmony on that for another 10 bucks. <laughs> and and they would ask her to do that. She was a she was a very successful demo singer. And uh, when I met her, and you know, what I told her, I said, "Look, everybody in town knows you're a great singer. I think you, we just need to do a showcase where you've uh, you can show people you can stand up in front of a room and do it." So we put a little band together and rehearsed some songs and. That's when I had She's in Love with the Boy and Down on My Knees. And there were several other songs off that first album that I just kind of had in my pocket or in the drawer. And she loved them. And we put together the set and invited Joe Galani from RCA to come. And we brought Mary Martin and this A&R crew and, and Tony Brown and his A&R crew from MCA came over. And both of them loved what we did. Every songwriter in town came because they all knew Trisha and loved her. And the place was packed. And uh, and uh, we put on a great show and she did a great job. And uh, Joe Galani was, he was, he was impressed. He said, well, this is really good. We, we should, maybe we should do a, a development deal. And, but Tony went out of his way. He said, those songs are incredible where'd you get those man those are, those are she's ready for radio now and i said well there's stuff that i had but there's more out there so so tony's enthusiasm you know impressed her and she and, and we both felt like that would be the best place for her even though tony had a lot of other women on the on the label at that time but they signed her in 1990 and uh that first album came out in 1991 but, you know, as far as what makes Trisha special, I don't know. It's just so many things that makes her special, not just her singing voice, but that alone is pretty, pretty astounding. Now, I know you may not be able to tell us a lot, but <laughs> some of the listeners out there might know that there's a new studio album that's going to be coming out sometime soon. What can you tell us about it? I can tell you I'm parked in front of the engineer's house. I'm expecting her to roll up here in about 10, about 20 minutes to do a, the last overdub of a little harmony part that she wanted to put on one of the songs. Um, Patty Lovelace is singing a harmony part on one of these songs, and uh, she wants to add one more part above Patty. So we're going to do that. It's a project that she called me about uh, a year ago, January she was ready to just kind of get back and do what we do. Let's just find the best songs that we can. You know, if, if we make something for radio, great. If not, let's just make the best record we can, we can out of the best songs we can find. Um, so that's what we've been doing uh, on and off for the past year. Uh, she also made another album earlier this year that's out there right now. It came out on Valentine's Day a project she did with Don was, and it's a tribute to Frank Sinatra. And it's fantastic. And she sings a lot of those big Frank Sinatra songs. And Vincent Mendoza did the arrangements. They're spectacular. They sound just like that period of time when Frank was at his peak. She used Al Schmidt, uh, an Al, uh, recording engineer that worked with Frank uh, several times in several projects. Al's just such a great, talented guy, and he's still doing it. And they did it at Capitol Studios, where Frank did a lot of those recordings. And he used Frank's, the same mic that Frank used, and same stool that Frank used, and uh, it was just a, it was just a pure, uh, pure fun for her to do that. And she just carries off some of that music like you just can't believe. I mean, that's what she, she's, she has. Harlan Howard told me once that that girl can sing the phone book, and he really meant it. You know, he really meant it. He loved her. She used to do a lot of his demos for him. He was such a fan of hers. But she really can do all kinds of things. And this this uh, this album she did in a tribute to Frank. It's called "Let's Be Frank." That's the name of the album. It's beautiful. Yes. Um, but but this other record we started. 
a year ago, like I said, we've been working on it off and on. She's got a cooking show on the Food Network that keeps her pretty busy a couple times a year doing those. She does 13 episodes of a stretch over three weeks, twice a year. So we would, you know, we'd record a few we recorded a few songs early on and, and we found some great songs early on. And, and we've been really thankful that we could still go out, like I said, into the orchard and find all these wonderful things that nobody had found yet or heard for themselves. You know, music goes through a lot of different things for different people and, you know, there's still great songs out there waiting to be sung. And we were able to find a bunch of them. And uh, we've got 14 sides in this new album. I think there's going to be 14. Uh, but there's some really pretty amazing stuff. And uh, I'm telling you, this girl has still got it. She can still just nail it. And, and just what a talent. What a talent. I'm not sure what else... I can tell you about it at this point. I think it'll be released probably, I think she's thinking about September. Uh huh. So, uh, her birthday is late September, so is mine. So that's our, that's our goal is to have it out by the, about the, about the 20th of September. We'll be looking forward to that. Something that I noticed about Trisha Yearwood's albums if you go through and you listen to him and if you look at the liner notes which is is something that i do she's somebody who there are certain songwriters she goes back to again and again like hugh prestwood for example and i'm just wondering like do you find that with artists like there are certain artists that it just seems like a songwriter is perfect for them well hugh certainly has had a you know, he's a great writer. I mean, the song I remember is when was a song that I had kind of tucked away um, that I pulled out one day and played for her and she loved it. And we just, you know, it ended up on one of her early albums and we've repeatedly gone back to, to him and he, he sends us lots of songs and we don't, we don't record lots of his songs, but we do find a few here and there. And, uh, but you know, he is such a talented guy and the way he writes and the kind of melodies and prose that he puts into his creations works well for her. We're lucky to find someone like you uh, that we can do that with. And there have been many writers that uh, I think that we've gone back to, but it's 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 a lot of it's not just the same it's not the same people every time. There's a lot of new young writers, uh, females on this new album that uh, you're going to, you're going to hear and are really great artists themselves. Lucy Silvis, Caitlin Smith, Hillary Lindsay among them. Really some really great material. Ashley McBride, a song that uh, some people will, will recognize as Ashley's, but it just, it fit Trisha like a glove and she didn't care if it had been recorded before she wanted to do it. So that's in there. Garth, you're giving us more clues. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, tr- I'm just talking, man. I can, <laughs> I can, I can jam, I can jam all day and, uh, and not say much, but I hope I'm making sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There were a couple of names you've mentioned of producers in this interview. Ellen Reynolds, for example, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping you can tell us, and not just limited to country music, just in general, the producers that have impressed you the most. Well, you know, producers are not people necessarily that you're aware of. You're aware of the artists, you know. Alan, Alan kind of became my mentor in encouraging me to move to Nashville. And he was the first guy, one of the first people I worked with in the studio as an artist. He just had an easy manner about him. He's able to, like I said earlier, what I, I try to pattern what I do after what he, what I saw him do, which is just kind of use common sense of what makes, what, what works for an artist, what doesn't work. And, 
you know, you know, let the song, let the song stand on its own. Don't get, don't get in the way of the song. You know, it's easy for some singers to over sing, you know, for them to go past the point of singing the song and telling the story as opposed to wanting to express every thing they can do musically with their voice. And that, that doesn't always make for the best record or the best performance. And, you know, I think those producers who can help an artist become, reach the full potential of what they're capable of, of doing. As far as people, you know, I have great respect for, you know, a couple of people that come to mind, Arif Marden, who did a lot of those Hall and Oates records, but also the Nora Jones records. Those are just such beautiful. That first really big album she had was such a beautiful record. There's a young Englishman who lives in Nashville now, Pete, Peter Sullivan, who produced a lot of those early Tom Jones records. And those, those were very impressionable records for me. I mean, those made a big, because they were big. I mean, he had a big voice, but those arrangements were big and they were spectacular records. And it was great to get to know him. There's the Don was, you know, I've met Don a couple of times. What he's done, what he did for, with Nick at Time, with Bonnie Raitt, was just such beautiful records. And Peter Asher with Linda Ronsett and James Taylor, my gosh. Those were such gentle, wonderful things to hear over and over and over. I'm hoping you could tell us about your experience working with New Grass Revival. <laughs> I, I first, I, I'm laughing because I, I described that to people. I wasn't producing as much as hanging on for dear life. <laughs> Those were really talented cats. I first met Sam Bush when I was working on, I was engineering a Doc Watson record, Doc and Merle Watson. I got to be a part of those records by way of Jack Clement, who knew Doc and Merle, produced a couple of records early on. And then I got to be a part as an engineer to record some of those records as well. And I first met uh, Sam on a doc. He was helping Doc record this project called it was, it was, uh, memories, the memories album it was kind of a doc revisiting all of, all of his musical influences. And, uh, I first met Sam, boy, that must have been like, what, 77 or 78, I'm guessing. Maybe even a little bit before that, but I met Sam. We became friends. Uh, Courtney Johnson was the banjo player at the time. They lived, uh, just up the road here, about 60 miles north in Bowling Green. And um, they were a fun hang. And I love, I got to know that band. And I was like, wow, can I help you guys? This would be great. I'd love to be a part of this. So I got to, I think I produced five, I think I produced or helped produce five Newgrass Revival records projects. And in, in different bands, the early band with, uh, with Courtney Johnson on banjo and the the Dobro guitar player at the time was a different person. And then Sam kind of reformed the group. Bela Fleck joined the group, young guy, a monster banjo player in New York City of all places. And Pat Flynn, who was uh, from uh, you know, the outskirts of L.A., uh, really amazing player. And I did three albums with that incarnation of the band. <laughs> and like I said, it was... It was as much as me hanging on for dear life as it was producing it. You know, I, I helped give them direction, but those guys knew what the hell they were doing and what they wanted to create. And, and maybe not knowing it exactly before they went in the studio, but when they got in there, they were in a creative mode and they were experimenting and doing, they were bending the genre for sure. Bluegrass. I mean, they called it new grass and uh, obviously and. And it was really something special to be a part of those records. And the, the influence, you know, they didn't sell a lot of those records, but to hear the number of people, uh, musicians who describe new, Newgrass Revival as an influence, and Garth Brooks even mentioned that, 
but also Jayhawks and a bunch of other you know, string cheese. What am I trying to say? Um, I can't remember the name of the band now. String cheese incident. That's it. That's it. Thank <laughs> yeah. you very much. There, is, there isn't a young bluegrass band going today that isn't influenced a little bit by Newgrass or Bible, or certainly by Sam Bush. <laughs> That's for sure. What's something that you would like to attempt in terms of producing, whether we're talking about an artist or just an artist you have worked with, that maybe you you have something you would like to do that you haven't yet. You know, I I don't I don't know. I don't know how to answer that because I've been able to be a part of so many amazing things. I don't know. I, I feel like I've been fortunate to get involved, to be involved with so many great projects along the way. There's, there's hardly anything in my wish list left. And I don't, I never really thought about my career as having a wish list and wanting to do this or that and the other. I was too busy just trying to keep up with the things that were coming at me. And, and you know, I was really fortunate to, Get to be involved with so many great artists and singers and musicians. I don't know how to answer that. Sorry, <laughs> but uh, you know that I've I've got a very had a very satisfying career, and uh, it's still going, and I'm thankful for that. What is the best thing about being Garth Fundus? <laughs> to be able to say that I produced Don Williams. Keith Whitley, Trisha Yearwood, and the her Sugarland record, and you know the Doc Watsons and the Newgrass revivals. Getting to meet all these amazing musicians in my life, and to be a part of this city, and to be a part of this creation and this movement that Nashville, going from kind of a sleepy little town where country music, oh yeah, it's those people over on Music Row, you know. The business of Nashville didn't really give much respect to the music business in Nashville. It was just like those those people up on Music Row. And now to see all of Na- the, you know Nashville blooming and exploding, really, and not not necessarily in a in a good way. It's just become big real fast and. The tourists, you know, I know it's important to a lot of people, but it's just the, the city has is growing at a very rapid pace right now. And I'm a little concerned of what the infrastructure is there to, to be able to handle it. I, I will always miss the peaceful little, you know, naive Nashville that I that I grew up in hmm. from the time I came. When I came here, I think I was 22 years old when I moved here. But it's, uh, it's been an amazing time. And I'm very thankful. I always like to close the interview. I just let the guest take the stage. Just take the microphone. What would you say to anyone who's tuned in? Let's listen to this whole interview. <laughs> Bless you and thank 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 y'all for coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh you know, again, I think I just said it. I, I just feel so fortunate to have been involved in so many great careers in my time and to have experienced such great music. And you know, I, I that that really is about it. Well, Garth, thank you very much for spending time with us. You're welcome. You're welcome, Paul. It's been a pleasure and you know, I hope I answered all your questions as best I could. You know, you get jamming on some of this stuff, and it's, you know, it's I kind of lose my way talking about it because I don't do very many of these. And I hope people have enjoyed what I've had to say. Absolutely. Love to do it again. All right. Well, until next time. Okay, buddy. All Appreciate right. Appreciate it. Have a good Thanks one. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye-bye. Bum up ba da beep up boo dot boop da beep ba da leap a knock at the bees I walk on tea girl I get it no it's a gong is in and gaga the keys I call oh oh is it oh we're gonna go on on swagging I believe it's all good but don't take a walk again goodbye